Good afternoon. I now call this meeting of the Standing Committee on Economic Development and Environment to order. My name is Katrina Knockleby, and I am the MLA for Great Slave, and I will be acting as the chair for this meeting. Uh, today we are receiving a public briefing with Alternatives North, Ecology North, and following that technical briefing, we will no longer be uh, having uh, what was on our agenda, a briefing from ENR, and that will be rescheduled for another date. I would like to remind all members and presenters to direct all questions and comments to myself as chair and to wait to be recognized before speaking in order to help us have a smooth meeting. I will now ask members to introduce themselves for the record, starting on my left. Thanks. Uh, <clears throat> Kevin O'Reilly, Frame Lake. <clears throat> okay. Jane Wayellen Armstrong, MLA for Mophie. Good afternoon, everyone. Rylan Johnson, MLA for Yellen. Thank you very much, uh, and just thank you for bearing with us. It's been a long day here at the Legislative Assembly. <laughs> so thank you very much for coming. Welcome, Ms. Tremblay. Uh, please introduce yourself and staff and anybody else and proceed with your opening remarks and presentation. Sure. Um, as you mentioned, my name is Don Tremblay, and I'm here uh, to discuss the recommendations submitted on the uh, Statement of Environmental Values. and. I, um, I was born in Fort Simpson, raised in Yellowknife. My parents are Nancy Trotter and the late Rick Trombley. And I'm presenting with my co-presenter here, uh, Heather. I'll let her introduce herself. And we're representing, as you mentioned, Ecology North and Alternatives North. Hi, I'm uh, Professor Heather McLeod Kilmurray from the Center for Environmental Law and Global Sustainability at the Faculty of Law of the University of Ottawa. Uh, I'm an uninvited settler on the unceded, unsurrendered land of the Anishinaabe Algonquin, uh, and I pay respects to the traditional guardians of this land. Thank you for having us. Thank you so much for being here. Um, please go ahead with your presentation. Sure. Just to confirm logistics, I just say slide. To move, slide. <laughs> um, so, brief outline for today. We'll do some quick introductions, which we just did, and proceed with the purpose of the Environmental Rights Act and the Statement of Environmental Values, uh, at which point I'll pass the mic over to Heather to review our recommendations, and then we have a brief opportunity to review what was released yesterday in terms of which re recommendations were accepted and not accepted. Slide. Um, so to further elaborate on the introduction, the challenges we face today I think are um, known to everyone in the room in terms of cli climate change, biodiversity loss, pollution and plastic waste. Plastic just being an example of waste and pollution in general. Um, there are obligations uh, listed in terms of indigenous legal rights systems and rights, environmental justice, international obligations um, that lead in sustainability in terms of creating circular economy. Um, and I will just read the ERA preamble because I think it actually is well worded um, in terms of our obligation the right to a healthy environment and a right to protect the integrity, biological diversity, and productivity of the ecosystems in the Northwest Territories on behalf of present and future generations. Um, a few examples of international obligations include UNDRIP, Paris Agreement, um, the SDGs, Sustainable Development Goals. Uh, and obviously all challenges and obligations aside, I think that a goal of this um, a goal is to be on the right side of history, be a model for future uh, other jurisdictions. I think that's an underlying goal for most of these types of things, but worth, worth noting. Slide. Um, this one has a lot of words. I will just read it. Uh, bear with me. <laughs> the purpose of the Environmental Rights Act is to protect the right of the people of the Northwest Territories to a healthy environment. Um, to provide the people of the Northwest Territories with tools to exercise, exercise their right to protect the integrity, 
biological diversity and productivity of ecosystems in the Northwest Territories to ensure that the GNWT carries out that responsibility within its jurisdiction to protect the environmental rights of the people of the Northwest Territories and to ensure that the GNWT carries out its responsibility to make environmental information accessible to the public in a reasonable, timely, culturally appropriate and affordable manner. Slide. Uh, James. Um, and so the overall message as required in the NWT Environmental Rights Act, a statement of environmental values explains how environmental considerations, including the right to a healthy environment, will be integrated into the GWT, into actions, decisions, recommendations, and sub board submissions. Um, obviously, the purpose is also to be a substantive framework for government decision making and a roadmap to inspire, measure, and document actions and empower people um, of the Northwest Territories to enforce. Uh, both the act and those values. Um, I slide. Um, further to elaborate on inspire and empower, key, some key points include education, both of the public and the people, as well as people informing government. So that goes both ways, and it's important to um, outline that. Access to information, participation, and access to justice. Um, and slide. These two we can go through pretty quickly. Uh, so transparency is also another key um, consideration. In order to achieve that, there needs to be a plan, it needs to be measurable, you need to report on that. Um, slide. <laughs> and accountability. <laughs> Ensuring that G the GNWT carries out its responsibility. Um, reporting helps create accountability. Uh, I think that's what I wanted to highlight in this particular slide. And then obviously transparency and accountability are both key components of good governance. So it makes sense that they are included here. And without further ado, I'm gonna pass it over to the recommendations as they were submitted slide to um, the committee and Heather. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Again. Thanks, Don. Uh, so it's an honor to have the opportunity to speak to you today about this important project, and I really wish I could have made the trip up to see your beautiful part of the world. Um, I wanted to start by saying that it's so exciting that the that the GNWT has created this act and the SEV. Um, as the UN and many others have noted, the triple threat of climate change, biodiversity loss, and pollution threaten us globally and many of the, the worst effects are already being felt in the North. So it's important that our generation tackles this now and takes big steps to move us to a sustainable and circular economy. Um, the costs of not doing our best right now are so vast and growing rapidly every day. So the costs of implementing the act and the SCV need to be measured against those, those growing costs. Um, just here uh, last week in Ottawa, we in our house were without power for five days because of the derecho that blew through uh, most of eastern, uh, southern uh, Canada this week. So we see it every day. Um, the uh, So I wanted to also say that the Northwest Territories Environmental Rights Act, as I think my colleague Linda Collins spoke about when she gave comments on the draft act is much better than in most other jurisdictions in Canada. Uh, it includes so many of the most widely recognized uh, and important environmental law principles. It includes the public trust doctrine. It emphasizes the unique relationship to the land of the people of the Northwest Territories and the huge importance of that ecosystem to, to the world as well. So um, it is really uh, an excellent act and the, the draft SCV is very good and I guess what we're, our submissions are just that with all of the energy and effort that's been put into these wonderful documents there are just a few gaps left that could really help to uh, uh, truly achieve the purposes behind this legislation um, and so that's why we're recommending some of the changes. We did note from the revised SCV that many of these changes have been made, which is great. And we'll just highlight a few of the gaps that we think remain that could, that could really uh, strengthen uh, this undertaking. 
So the first one is to remove what was Section 5 of the SCB. I think now it's Section 6. Um, and I note from the What We Heard document the con that this is a standard clause across JNWT policy documents. And there's a concern about fettering discretion, which makes which absolutely makes sense. However, I would just note that you know discretion is never supposed to be unlimited. And there's so much energy has got into this act and this statement of values that this section almost gives the impression that all of this is optional, ultimately, which creates a danger of undermining credibility, I think, on some level. So I think that's the, that's the message behind this recommendation. Uh, slide, please. So a lot of the language uh, in our recommendations was to enhance transparency and accountability, which are the, really the, among the driving forces behind environmental rights legislation. And so a lot of the um, recommendations to make some of the language mandatory has been adopted in the revised SCV, so that's fantastic. Uh, the Act is intended to create binding obligations on the government. And so in terms of transparency and accountability, I think the gaps that remain are an annual report that not only encourages accountability and transparency, but also achieves this goal of education and, and access to information for people to know what's happening. And so this is something that's still not uh, in the SCB that, that I think would make a difference. And also a mandatory periodic review. The, the SCV does and the Act allow for a review of the SCV when, when desired, but there's no mandatory regular period when we can count on the fact that the government will be obligated to review this to keep it as, as cutting edge and current as it is now, and I think that would be a useful addition. Slide, please. So the, the flip side of the obligations of the government to uh, protect the rights and to ensure access to information is this um, other role, the partnership role with the public and with stakeholders in the Northwest Territories. And so the Act is also designed to empower their participation in this joint effort to achieve ecological sustainability um, and uh, uh, economic, social, and environmental sustainability. And so empowering participation and education, I note, we, we noted from the changes to the SEV that um, we uh, the word meaningful involvement has been added to um, involvement or participation, which is great. And there's been some language added that the government will actively seek out participation uh, for various stakeholders. And I guess what would make this even more powerful is just more clarity on what does meaningful participation look like. And so in our submissions, we've tried to give an example or two from other jurisdictions, some best practices that we find there in terms of what meaningful participation looks like. And describing this can also have the advantage of perhaps creating some consistency among different departments of the government as to what, what is understood by meaningful involvement. So uh, those are some of the things that we, we think could, could still be improved. Slide, please. And this one's fairly quick. So again, uh, it's wonderful to see that the government of the Northern Territories is leading the pack and in including these expressed in international environmental law principles and so many of them in the Act and SCV, which is great. All we were recommending is that the wording of these very well-recognized, very well-discussed, researched, litigated principles, the, the definitions have sort of solidified and several of them in the SCV are not the same as what you would find at the international level and across other jurisdictions. And so just the concern is that um, inconsistency um, leads to a lack of clarity and predictability. So often it saves a lot of time and money to have these things be consistent and predictable so that they don't become subject to litigation or debate or, or, or fighting. So some of them, again, have been changed in the new version, which is great, but some of them remain inconsistent. And I think that's just the concern that it can, can be costly and, and a waste of time to debate um, why the different wording. Slide, please. Uh, yeah, so in terms of tools for applying the SCV, we made a bunch of suggestions, and it's great to see that in the revised SEV, that consideration of biodiversity, cumulative effects, which is a huge problem all across Canada in terms of environmental protection and um, monitoring, et cetera, 
and climate change. Those three things have all been added as express considerations in the revised section five sub six. So that's fantastic. And I guess just the hope remains then, since it's a little bit less detailed than what we had recommended, is you know the question remains, how will the government balance these various ecological considerations with the considerations for political, economic, and other considerations? And the goal is that the SCB will help to make sure that the government sort of tries to integrate all of these considerations together so that you end up with win-win policies that benefit both you know, biodiversity and the economy at the same time, rather than having to do trade-offs between these goals, to see them as mutually reinforcing rather than competing. Uh, next slide, please. So this one, again, I said, I said it ha climate change has been specifically included in Section 5.6. Um, we had proposed that it be a separate heading, and I see that there are, there are a lot of policy documents in the Northwest Territories about climate change, which is fantastic. And so I guess the view is that it's not needed here, um, but I guess the counter-argument was, well, if there's so much um, engagement and... Um, engagement to include climate change in all act activities and decisions, why not also include it here as a, as a special heading to emphasize its importance? But it has been included in 5.6, so that is, that is an improvement. Uh, next slide, please. These recommendations come from the fact that um, in Ontario, there is an environmental commissioner and an environmental registry, and they were specifically created when the Ontario Environmental Bill of Rights was created, which, as I said, is, is much weaker than your act. But the reason they were included is because the Ontario Environmental Bill of Rights was specifically modeled on a political accountability model rather than a, a legal accountability model, rather than putting so much power in the courts. And so it was really important to make sure people got access to information, but also that you had this independent third party that was overseeing and was part of this political accountability. So um, given that that has not been taken up, I guess the question remains, well, what are the tools to ensure this political accountability and are they robust enough uh, in, the, in the Northwest Territories? And if not, perhaps on the next revision, if, if it's found that the political accountability is lacking, perhaps consider that these might be tools. And there's other ways of doing it, of course, the Attorney General and other, other actors can, can uh, undertake some of this information. But the goal behind these institutions is to help with uh, accountability. And so if that seemed to be lacking, these are some tools that are available mm -hmm. elsewhere. Uh, next slide, please. So this was a big subject of discussion as we worked through developing our recommendations with Alternatives North and Ecology North. And I mean, as all of you know, I'm sure um, a lot of countries are recognizing rights of nature and earth rights and the personhood of rivers and other entities. And so many of our suggestions to change some of the wording was to include words like present and future generations of all species in the Northwest Territories because we'll never achieve a sustainability by continuing to prioritize human needs exclusively and not understanding that we're just part of this intricate ecological web. And so moving, as I said, the NWT is already at the forefront in Canada with th this act and the SEVs, but including this kind of more ecocentric perspective would put you up with the most uh, sort of ecologically progressive um, documents in the world from a legal perspective. So that's part of the suggestion there. And I think it's the last slide next, please. Uh, our last suggestion was in some other jurisdictions, um, these types of acts or statement of values include things like leading by example so that the government will lead by example by in greening its internal operations. And so it was great to see in the what we heard document that there's many other tools, many other documents, many other measures and steps that the government is taking to do this. And so therefore, it's not necessary to include it in the SCV. But I guess, once again, the flip side of the argument is, why not make all of these policies consistent? Why not um, uh, let this add to the commitments that the government has made elsewhere 
to reduce its own emissions, to use procurement as a way to reduce food waste and various other things that help with, with sustainability. So thank you again for this opportunity to speak to you, and uh, we would very much welcome your, your questions and comments. And I'll turn it back to Dawn. We just made a quick chart for your information about what happened with the various recommendations in case that's of use to you. But otherwise, I turn it back to Dawn. Sure. Let's just have a quick look. Kind of glance at the. <laughs> there's some check marks and there's quite a few X's, <laughs> and essentially they've just been summarized by Heather. So this is just another visual tool to communicate that. Maybe slide. We did go through. There's 20 odd recommendations. Um, I don't. If you want to read it. And then we go to the next one, but I don't want to rush anyone either. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. We're just uh, doing some uh, <laughs> technical things here and lost our slide deck. Um, maybe we, yeah, maybe we can just uh, move on to our questions at this point. I do like the idea as an engineer of things like summarized up very nicely for me. If so, if we could share the. Those, get those last couple slides too, that might be helpful. But uh, I just want to say I was nodding along with everything that you said. So thank you so much for the presentation. And I'm going to look at my colleagues now to see who would like to start with questions. But don't both jump at once. <laughs> okay, we'll start with uh, Member O'Reilly. Please go ahead. Um, yeah, thanks, uh, Madam Chair. And thanks to our uh, guests for the, the presentation. Um, I just want to start with a few comments about uh, um, where we kind of ended up with uh, a new Environmental Rights Act and uh, I know that uh, um, if I can call you Heather, <laughs> that uh, Heather mentioned that um, Linda Collins had uh, made a, a very significant uh, contribution to where we ended up with the Environmental Rights Act and through the NGOs as well that uh, the principles that she suggested get incorporated into the the act as considerations have actually made their way now into the uh, the uh, statement of environmental values so that was very very critical work and I think it shows the values of NGOs and participating in this process and uh, uh, us as a standing committee as regular members being able to uh, negotiate and, and convince ministers to to do things better so hats off to you for your last set of interventions and I did read the the submission on this one I think it was excellent very well referenced and clearly uh, Heather you've got lots of experience in Ontario so uh, I, I just can't say enough good things about the stuff that you guys have, have submitted um, I guess uh, maybe if I could get a little bit more comment on the um, the, the lack of uh, annual reporting in particular like we've got I would make if it was if I was a minister there'd be lots more improvements that I'd see a lot more uh, X's or, or not X's check marks to the recommendations you made but without any kind of public reporting how do we know that this is actually being implemented in any way like um, cabinet has total discretion to decide when and where this might things might get exempted or not where this wouldn't be applied and it all sort of hinges on whether there's significant you know environmental uh, effects or impacts if I get the, the wording right so th and that's not even defined in here anywhere so we don't know in any way or I, how's the public how's the MLA supposed to know if any of this actually ever gets implemented thanks madam chair Thank you, Mr. O'Reilly. Um, Ms. Trombley, would you like to take that? Sure. Um, I think that's a great question. I don't have an answer. Um, but I think that it's a really important question, and I think that was one of the reasons that recommendation was included. Um, so unfortunately, that was a recommendation with an X. I don't know if um, my colleague Heather has anything to add to that. but. Well, I guess that's the thing. I think that's why I did. Uh, we were emphasizing that that remains important because, you know, in the absence of a commissioner, that's what the, the commissioner writes reports, and I'll tell you whether or not they're uptaken, <laughs> particularly given the uh, whether they get whether they get taken up is another thing. But the commissioner documents it 
you know, as an independent observer, what they see as what the government has or hasn't done. And so if you don't even have that independent observer, then it's even more important to just have access to the actual information. Um, so that people will be able to know what's going on. And I think the other thing is, if I know that I have to report on what I did today, I'm going to be more careful about what I did today. You know, so I think that that just the, the knowledge that there that this is this additional uh, sort of check on whether or not people are, uh, you know, keeping with their the, the clear intentions in the act um, in the face of uh, difficult, you know, um, Try to balance different interests. I think that 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 obligation to report is is really important, both for transparency and also for access to information and education. Thank you for that, um, Mr. O'Reilly. Do you have a follow up? Um, yeah, no. Thanks for that. Uh, I did try to move uh, uh, an amendment to the Environmental Rights Act in the last assembly that would have incorporated annual reporting on the implementation of the environmental values, uh, statement of environmental values, in the annual report under the ERA. We got a report tabled in the House yesterday on the Environmental Rights Act, and I think it was three pages, and it basically said nobody's filed any requests for investigations. There was no um, uh, money uh, uh, decided through prosecutions. Uh, 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 anyways, nothing was done, quite frankly, zero. So uh, th we do have a tool for annual reporting under the Environmental Rights Act, but nobody knows about it, nobody uses it, and uh, our government doesn't even promote it well enough. But um, yeah, I. I this this issue of the lack of reporting, I know you made some other recommendations about ways this could be encouraged and promoted, building this into mandate letters for ministers. Um, there's no requirement for documentation even uh, uh, d of decisions where this is used or not used. So if there's no record trail, I don't know how we, we know whether this is going to be implemented in any way and there's nobody overseeing it other than a, a lowly standing committee that you know may not even get to it every every four years because there's no periodic review. So anyways, I'd, I'd be interested to hear if there's other examples from other jurisdictions where there's more of a, a check and balance in terms of reporting, implementation, accountability. Because Look, in, in in theory, this looks really good, but in practice, I can tell you, my experience being here for six years, nothing's going to change, just at a time where we need things to change. Thanks. Thank you so much. I think I already know what ENR is going to get when they get in front of us here. Um, so I think we'll take go over to Ms. McLeod Kilmurray uh, for the answer on this one, if you don't mind. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, I guess the Environment Registry is the other tool that there that is, and I'm certainly not giving Ontario as a shining example of, of a you know raging success, but the Environmental Bill of Rights it's under review at the moment as well because of, of lots of shortcomings and and you know active um, putting new policies in place in order to circumvent some of the obligations in the Act. I'm certainly not suggesting that Ontario has all the answers, but with the Environmental Registry, there is an obligation to post all of these documents and to give uh, time for comments whenever there's a, a new Act, a new proposal, a new policy. I'm not sure if that happens already in the Northwest Territories, but that's another mandatory way to ensure people get access to information. Thank you for that. I was just uh, asking or inquiring whether or not our, our uh, regulatory system and, and the registries that we have uh, would be sort of somewhat similar to that and whether they would be complementary. But it's not my turn to ask a question, so I'll head over to MLA Johnson. So go ahead, MLA Johnson. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Well, I'll answer your question as I've heard MLA O'Reilly's <laughs> conversations many times to <coughs> create a proper and fulsome environmental registry. And ours is not quite populated to the extent it should be. But uh, I, I guess I would like to, well, I'm going to start with a few comments. I'd like to thank both of our presenters. And uh, I, uh, I had the honor of being uh, working at ENR and touring and uh, helping draft the Environmental Rights Act in the last assembly, and then had to spend a lot of time with this uh, committee in uh, accepting some of their recommendations. Uh, and, and, I, and I guess I want to say that uh, last year we had our first complaint under the new Environmental Rights Act at Tarbigan Mine Site on the 
uh, Ingram Trail, and it actually resulted in the GNWT uh, doing a health, human health risk assessment. We got a presentation recently, and you know, it, it took a site that had been sitting kind of in status quo for decades, and a few million dollars of public money started the process to remediate it. And I really do think that the complaint that one of my constituents led under the Environmental Rights Act kind of spurred the department to, to take that seriously. So. Uh, this legislation has had its first successful, and I encourage anyone who's watching this that t to use this act. It's a great act, and uh, I think there's an, a desire to bring the statement of environmental lines into GNWT practice uh, in that same vein. I know today we just announced the Adege National Wildlife Area, one of the first uh, that's finally been settled after years and years, and GNWT is you know taking lots of steps on conservation uh, areas and. The, some of the first indigenous protected areas in Canada are, are going forward here. So uh, we, we are making progress. Uh, but during, I, I guess I wanted to ask a, a bit of a question uh, to Heather there uh, during the Environmental Rights Act. And in this presentation, there was a lot of talk about kind of the rights of nature. Uh, I, I believe Ecology North during that act uh, handed out uh, David Boyd's book, uh, The Rights of Nature to Everyone. And I, I, uh, all the ENR staff, I, I can assure you, did read it. Uh, but I, I, it's been a number of years since that time, so I, I would just welcome uh, any insight on kind of what's going on in that area. I know there's some examples in New Zealand, and, and I think this is a conversation that we are beginning to have in the NWT with protected areas and such, and you know, whether we should give them some sort of litigation right to, to protect biodiversity or you know, different ecosystems. So I, I would just welcome an update, uh, any insight of what's going on in that world. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Johnson. Um, Ms. McLeod Kilmurray, would you like to go ahead? Yes, thanks, Madam Chair. Thank you for the question. And yeah, it's it's wonderful to see that that things are working and that changes happen as a result of all of this, all of this work. So that's that's great news. Yes. So in terms of the rights of nature, it does. I mean, it's certainly not without its critics as well, right? There's lots of people who talk uh, who think that rights based analysis is not the way to go. That sometimes it is seen as sort of individualistic. Um, some uh, indigenous legal traditions, I, I understand, think a lot more about duties rather than rights, right? And rather than does the river have rights or do the caribou have rights, it's do what, what obligations do we have toward them that's really more important. But it does seem to be... Um, uh, spreading so there's you know the river in, in in New Zealand there's actually been a river in Quebec that's been granted legal personhood and so again actually I got to work um, with on a project with a student and um, with some workers from the Laurier University who are working with the Dene on, on on the beautiful lake there and talking about you know what is the correct way do do we want to make them legal persons do we want to make them legal beings one of my colleagues from the University of Victoria just wrote a book about animals and their beingness rather than personhood because you want to you know you give they're not people and others have written about how humans have human rights, trees have tree rights, rivers have river rights, you know, so there, there, there's a lot of um, um, discussion about the best way to go about it. But I guess the bottom line is that because our system is so anthropocentric and focused on human beings, and how can we force human beings to take into consideration the other parts of the ecosystem? And so if the only language you get is rights, and that we as humans get is rights, then I guess we have to give rights to those to try to uh, create enforceable protections and to, to make sure that those other entities have as much value in the legal system as you know timber or meat or whatever we were trying to use them for so i think that's that's the the, the uh, uh, analysis behind it and um so it, it's still so relatively new that they have been given rights that I, it'll be interesting to see what that actually produces does it increase protection the other thing that's interesting is the procedural aspect so um like how obviously the river can't speak. So the, how, different pieces of legislation have created different models for how these resources are, are spoken for. And I know, for example, in New Zealand that it's a joint committee of Maori and um, settler uh, peoples in Australia who, who are created as an independent, a joint committee who act on behalf of the river. Um, and so, there's lots of different models for procedurally how this how this should happen. Um, 
But, uh, you know, it's as I say, it's not without its critics, but it's just, you know, the best idea we've had so far because the usual approach to environmental protection, which is go ahead and do what you were going to do, but just try to minimize the damage, that has not worked. And so these are some new models to try to add strength to um, to the importance of the ecosystems that we literally can't live without. I don't know if that helps. Uh, thank you, um, Emily Johnson. Did you have a follow-up? Uh, no real follow-up other than just to thank uh, Don for presenting today and Professor McLeod Kumari for presenting. And appreciate your work. And you know, I think committee will try and get the, a few more check marks following this. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for that. I'm just going to make my quick comment here before I see if uh, there's a second round, which I'm assuming there is. Um, I just wanted to say I, I come from like the engineering background, etc. And and I just like so I actually had a conversation with Miss Tremblay yesterday where I'm like all about you know there's a lot of processes and statements and and value statements and mission statements that get made in government that to me just after some time it becomes just lip service and words uh, so I kind of have to admit I sort of had that bit of mentality coming into this and so I do appreciate the comments around the fact of you know the reporting and the you know actually applying this and and now learning more about the right uh, the act but um, and just I guess saying that to me having things that are actionable and doable uh, then we'll have that buy-in and what you were saying about um, if someone has to report on it they're going to think more about what they're actually doing so uh, I have to say this has been very reassuring to me that it's not just another sort of mission statement that then as my colleague was saying could then just be ignored or not uh, not followed up on so I very strongly support the idea of sort of the annual review the annual reporting type mechanism of that and then I have to ask if we've just had our only our first sort of one under this act is it just a matter Matter that people don't even know uh, that they can go and, and file a complaint under this act. Um, I'm going to guess that a lot of just general citizens wouldn't realize uh, that there is that sort of mechanism in place. So mine are more just comments. Uh, I'm not sure if either of you would like to respond. However, I know that Mr. O'Reilly does have lots of questions. So if I don't see your hands pop up here, uh, I'm going to pass back over to Mr. O'Reilly. Thank you. Uh, okay, I guess I'm next. Thanks, uh, Madam Chair. Um, yeah, well, I, I could go on for a long time about all of this stuff, but um, uh, a friend of mine, Chris O'Brien, and myself, we were the first ones to actually use the original Environmental Rights Act in 1991, I think it was, and it did, it was about emissions from the giant mine, and it did kind of bring some public attention to it uh, and so on. But in, in the 20 or 25 years that the act was in place, it was the only one, the only request for an investigation. Uh, I think there was a couple of others that were attempted, but the minister refused to do anything about them. So it, it's not a very often used piece of legislation. Let's leave it at that. Um, but I, I guess a couple things that I wanted to pick up on. You know, we had a, a presentation in this committee from Department of Lands about uh, a document uh, to try to apply a set of land use sustainability uh, principles to GNWT decisions. And uh, we also have some sort of a, a cabinet level guide for how uh, departments are supposed to incorporate, uh, supposed to incorporate uh, climate change into their decision making. It's a very, very weak uh, approach, quite frankly, a checklist and there's all kinds of ways of getting out of doing it. Anyways, we've also got a sustainable development policy as a government, but I, I and there's really nothing in this um, a uh, statement of environmental values that connects all of these different things that, you know, as a, as a public servant, there has to do a lot of different things. And if there's no uh, way to connect dots or figure out what they're supposed to do when projects are being planned or reviewed or budgets are being developed and so on, as a civil servant, they've got no guidance to work with and no sense of priorities. So anyways, if you have any comments, suggestions on that, or observations from other jurisdictions, or even from having looked at the Statement of Environmental Values, I'd, I'd be happy to, to get any uh, comments. Thanks, Madam Chair. 
Thank you. Um, we're just gesturing back and forth with Ms. Tremblay. She's nominated you, uh, Heather, for the, <laughs> the response to this one. Go ahead. <laughs> Okay, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, yeah, well, I, I did see that the, you have this guidance document for incorporating climate change. And, and so I, I, I guess I anticipated that there might be a similar one for the SEV, but it seems like that's not that's not planned. And that, that would be, especially if that's a, a sort of a, a becoming a standard practice to have these guidelines um, or guidance documents, that, that might be a, an excellent start. Um, and then, of course, again, would be strengthened if you had to fill in a one pager that did what did you, did you fit? Did you do all of these guidelines? It, it can be an exercise in checklisting, of course, but even just having to go through that exercise, you know, um, certainly, I mean, it certainly empowers those who want to do it, right? If you have a group of people where there's some that want to and some that don't want to, if it's a requirement that you have to fill out it, it can strengthen their position. Um, and I think it can then just become an ingrained habit. Which is an excellent thing that you that you you're not wondering what you should do that you know every time that this is what you should do. So, I think a guideline on how to implement the SCD would be fantastic. But maybe a couple of examples, you know, examples of how it was done well in you know a couple of different contexts because it'll be different, obviously, depending on different uh, departments. That would be um, great. But then again, to have to make that public, I think, is 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 what really adds the teeth. Thank you. Uh, just before I go back to Mr. O'Reilly, that reminds me of sort of the onset of safety uh, checklists and safety training maybe a decade or so ago where it really was, it took a long time for the buy-in. There was the period of lip service and, and checking and then the ways to be more innovative around actually getting people to do the, the stop, you know, and check and look and, and assess, right? So Mr. O'Reilly, do you have a follow-up question? Uh, sure, no, I, I, I appreciate the, the comments and that was one of my observations having gone through the document is like, as I say, if you're a public servant sitting there with a lot of competing demands on your time, somebody throws the statement of environmental values at you, what do you do with it? Like, holy mackerel, there's all these principles and international conventions and things you're supposed to consider and no no explanation as to how to actually apply it. So not not good. Uh, and if it's, because if, if people don't understand it and don't, fit, can't, figure out how to actually apply it, it won't get used. And we have no way of documenting that. But anyways, um, uh, one of the other things, though, that was raised in the... Sorry, can I interrupt? I'm sorry to interrupt if I may, Madam Chair. Um, yes, it just crossed my mind, too, that some things are sort of more easily measurable than others. And so, you know, if, it, if for example, you had to say, it, when you have a proposal, how many carbon emissions will this create as opposed to the other the other proposal or not doing anything or doing it differently for example you can think of those really measurable things or if it's po i mean i i definitely don't always recommend that you put everything into dollars because you can't it's very hard to put a value dollar value on a lot of the environmental values um but if it is possible sometimes to say, well, this is going to cost X, but it's going to save X in terms of emissions or biodiversity or whatever else. You know, if there are some, like maybe just saying in this project, is it possible to measure? You know, and then, and then some of those things are more concrete, I think. And there are examples like the National Trade Corridor Fund where you do have to do that when you're applying to get that funding. So I'm just going to go back to Member O'Reilly for one last question before we wrap up here today. Thank you. Yeah, no, thanks. Uh, yeah, I, I love uh, evaluations of options and we rarely get that as uh, legislators, very rarely. We get presented fait accompli. Uh, uh, this is the project. So in any event, uh, you did mention in your submission and even here today, the idea of an environmental registry and uh, funny you should do that because I, I raised the issue of regulation making here in the Northwest Territories and how we do have a cabinet level policy or something around this that leaves discretion to each minister to decide whether they're even going to hold any public engagement around uh, a regulation. Um, but um, uh, from what I saw in the statement of environmental values and in the legislation, there's no prohibition on an environmental registry. There's nothing that would preclude it from being set up. Um, we've got some experience, on, which is not, well actually we, with the co-management bodies, as some of my colleagues have mentioned, that's a great uh, tool and expectation that's been set now in terms of people being able to access information about land and water use. 
uh, decision-making processes and have the ability to comment on them in a very structured and constructive way. Um, we don't have that when GNWT starts to get involved in things, and I keep trying to point them to this, but um, any other sort of observations from how the, uh, uh, the, the, the Ontario Environmental Registry works or re registries work in other jurisdictions that we can learn from and maybe build on, even if our government doesn't really want to go there sometimes. Thanks, Madam Chair. Thank you. Um, Ms. Uh, McLeod McKilmery. <laughs> Yeah, so, uh, well, I think in the Ontario Bill of Rights, that is one thing that is a strength in that in that legislation, that it's mandatory to create the registry. It was mandatory. That's, it, it, can you hear sirens? There's, they're coming through my window. <laughs> so you're not in danger. Hopefully I'm not either. Um, yeah, it, it, it was mandatory as creating the commissioner and the registry was in the act. Um, and so that made it mandatory. So they didn't have discretion. But I guess when I did read the, the What We Heard report, it did seem to say that it's not possible to do that because of the act. And I must say I was a little bit confused about that, I think, if I'm reading it correctly. I think it said in the What We Heard report that it's not because it's in the act, you're not allowed to do it. And I, I'm not sure, I'd have to look at it again more closely, but I'm not sure that that would necessarily be correct. It's, it, it would be correct that you're not required to do it, but I don't see why you wouldn't be enabled to do it. Yes, it says there is currently no provision in the ERA that would provide the legal authority to create an environmental registry, and it's outside the scope of authorities of intended applicability of the SEB. So I, I, I guess I would have to do a bit more research, but that, that sounds puzzling to me. Thank you for that. Um, and yeah, I was just sort of, we were saying here that we can also look into that on our end. Uh, we do have wonderful research staff, et cetera, that can, can help us with that. So on that note, and I know we could go on for a long time, but it has been a long day here. And we were laughing because we actually had a fire uh, alarm earlier. So the sirens were maybe triggering us a little bit. Um, so thank you both so much for coming today. It was really informative and I, I appreciate both of your passion for this work and, and the enthusiasm and it's definitely definitely uh, very informative and helps us to do our jobs better. So thank you so much. And we hope you get here at some point uh, <laughs> to visit us up here, Heather. <laughs> I would love to. And thank you to, to everyone. And uh, just on the last slide, it has our, our contact too. So I'll pass it back to Don. Perfect. Uh, Ms. Trombley, do you have anything to say before you? I just thank you for your time. I know it's been a really long session and day, so I hope you all enjoy the weekend and get some time to relax. Thanks. Thank you. I'm sure that we will. And yes, we very much appreciate this. It won't be the last conversation I'm sure that our committee will be having with you. So thank you. And that ends the, uh, that concludes the uh, public meeting portion of our Sorry, the public portion of our meeting. So thank you very much for everyone joining us online and uh, we'll be back another day. Thanks.